Literary Press. I'm your host, Riley Bounds, and this is the Solem Podcast, where we discuss and examine the intersection of the modern renaissances in evangelical literature, philosophy, and spiritual formation. Today, I'm excited to have Andrew Reichard on the podcast. Andrew is an author who lives in Grand Rapids, Michigan. His short fiction has appeared in journals such as The Collagist, Black Static, Space and Time Magazine, Decomp, and others. His short fiction, A Prayer, was published in Solemn Journal Volume 1, and another short piece, Titanomachy, will appear in Volume 2, both of which we will be discussing today. More information will be given in the show notes, including a link to his contributor page on the Solemn website if you want to find out more. So, Andrew, welcome, and thanks for joining me today. Glad to be here. Great. So, just tell us a little bit about yourself, uh, namely, how did you come to Christ? Yeah, so, um, well, undramatically, uh, I grew up in a Christian household, um, and uh, so that was, uh, it was part of the you know, part of our upbringing um, to a large degree. Um, and I remember, I remember I was very young when I made um, a you know, conscious decision to have a very specific type of prayer um, on my own. Um, <clears throat> and uh, yeah, I largely attribute that to, um, to the way that my, that my parents um, spoke about uh, faith and about, about Christ. Um, I think it was significant that it wasn't like that it didn't happen in church. It happened as a kind of a a home family moment, um, sort of a private matter. And uh, I've been thinking about that more actually uh, since I'm a a more, a a more recent parent myself um, Mm -hmm. thinking about how to um, how to have that conversation uh, organically. And, um, and, you know, in, in, in some ways, um, uh, guilelessly. Um, Mm -hmm. and, um, I, I, I would like, you know, I'd like my children to have a a similar moment as I did. And I don't remember exactly how old I was. It was somewhere in the, you know, elementary school, uh, range of days, but I do remember exactly where I was standing, um, in uh, a house that we moved away from, uh, before I was in middle school. Um, and I think, uh, I think part of the significance of that, um, of that moment, you know, of, of prayer and acceptance, um, was that it was the first time I remember being, um, aware of being part of a significant moment, if that makes sense. Mm. Mm. Yeah, that's very interesting. Um, now, as far as your, uh, writing, would you consider yourself to be an experimental writer or maybe a, a, something of a different genre or, I mean, to that end, even do you think that classifying your, your stuff is just kind of unhelpful or futile? Not futile, no. Uh, I think that uh, classifications have limited uses. Um, <clears throat> you know, they're helpful. Uh, they're helpful for categorizations um, and, and, you know, to, to have conversations to begin with. Um, but they, they, they only go so far. Um, I'm not against being called a experimental writer. I'm not like offended by that term at all. Um, I think, you know, in a lot of ways I do um, partake in experimentation. Um, But, uh, um, but it's not like, it's not something that I think about so much as, you know, am I this or am I that? Um, Each story that I write is, is completely separate from, from the others um, in, um, not necessarily thematically, but in like in the mindset that I go into it. Um, and so I don't often, uh, you know, set out to um, break such and such convention. Um, it's more just, uh, just just what comes out. Mm. Um, would you say that your, your fiction kind of shares stylistic conventions with postmodern literature kind of in the vein of like, Oh, William Gaddis or Thomas Pynchon or uh, folks like that. Um, 
Maybe. It's funny that you mentioned that because I one of the things that caught my attention about Solon to begin with was that it was a Christian journal that references looking for writers who are doing stuff in the vein of, of Gaddis and Pynchon, um, who are, you know, profoundly unchristian thinkers. Um, Gaddis in particular, I mean, he talks about his background. I think, I think he talks about his background as being uh, in sort of reformed, uh, rigid reformed uh, theology. And he rejects that openly in all of his fiction that I read. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, you know, that's an interesting, um, it's, I, I, I admire both those, both of those writers for, for different reasons. Um, but it's an interesting tension to then, to then think of yourself emulating them um, in a certain way. Um, I think of them as inspirational stylistically. Um, and, uh, you know, they're both well within the kind of postmodern tradition. Um, I think, I think the best art challenges itself um, and the current popular strains in its midst. Um, and that's, to me, that's the positive face of postmodernism. Um, there's a lot of, there's a lot of facets to postmodernism, but the, the sort of uh, the, the, the challenge of convention is, is, is what I think is the po- positive thing about it. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, and just, just to clarify for our listeners, there's a lot of, um, just heat around the term uh, postmodernism. What we mean by that here is the literary style. Um, we don't mean the the postmodern philosophy or what's very popular today, like in in secular universities or anything like that. And we also, I mean, ov- obviously, you don't endorse the, the nihilism of the postmodern philosophy, right? We all, and you also don't accept. Uh, I'm assuming. Um, Gaddis's worldview, or you don't want, you don't want to promote his view, but you do want to. I mean, you do want to borrow from his style. Um, you can still appropriate a literary style without adhering to the um, to the motive behind it. And in fact, right. you can use the style for for different purposes, which is obviously what you're doing and why I think your your writing is just so fresh and original and brilliant. Um, so. Anyway, just just a word of clarification. Um, now, if you, if you do feel that you you borrow those conventions, what do you say is intentional or some something you just do something subconsciously? That yeah, that's a that's a question that I think about a lot um, because I don't uh, I don't want to you know appropriate someone's style. Um, I read, I read a lot and, and I, I do often find myself sort of by nature emulating a certain style, sometimes in the vein of what I'm reading right now. And I, I, I do try to avoid that. Um, you know, when I have, when I have time to write, I try to write something that is, uh, dissimilar in style and, and theme and everything else. Um, from what I'm reading just so that there's a disconnect and I don't sort of unconsciously take on a lot of the uh, stylistic quirks or, or kind of language dis, uh, dis, you know, decisions uh, of the author I'm reading. Um, but, uh, but yeah, I mean, influences are hard to track. I, I have been influenced by a lot of, um, a lot of your, uh, you know, your big name, the postmodern or any of them really big name, but, a lot of the, you know, a lot of the postmodern heavy hitters. I, I kind of went through a phase where I was reading a lot of DeLillo and a lot of Pinchon and a lot of Bowman. Um, but uh, I, I like them for the, I like them for their stylistic um, uh, decisions and the ways that they, um, the ways that they think about prose. Some, some kind of deconstruction um, thoughts that they always have. I mean, Delillo is, is incredibly, um, uh, incredibly thoughtful and insightful, almost to a fault. Um, and there, there's a certain amount of, um, of self-consciousness of almost like a, a kind of, we're thinking about writing, we're writing about writing. It's very meta. Um, 
and it's not possible to overthink anything. <laughs> and there's a, there a, to a certain point that's attractive to me. Um, I I can I conflate writing or or any art with thinking to a to a certain degree. Um, and to me, I think that's what that's what defines good writing. Um, and I would say all art, but I you know I don't. I'm not a musician. I'm not a painter. So I mean, just talking about writing here, but uh, mm -hmm. um, to me, good writing is good thinking. And I write in order to think. Um, and uh, I write in order to ask questions and then to kind of formulate some kind of open response. And whether that's a, um, usually that doesn't come down to, here's what I think about this. It, it may just be kind of an open question uh, towards the end, but um, that's really why I write. And I, I see a lot of these, uh, uh, you know, postmodern think writers, um, doing a similar thing when they're, when they're doing something that I can admire. And it's not always the case. Um, I see them doing something like, like that, writing to think, um, writing to, 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 to figure out what they're doing. Um, and, uh, um, and I like that. Yeah. Yeah. You know, uh, DS Martin said something very similar in our very first podcast. He said, um, I don't, it's something to the effect of, I don't, I don't write to tell you what I think I write to discover what I think. Yeah. Um, I like that. And, uh, yeah, yeah. It sounds kind of like you're in the same vein. Um, now I know I gave that caveat about postmodernism earlier, but, um, I mean, the fact, the fact of the matter is that postmodernism as a, as a literary genre too is highly, highly secular. Um, mm -hmm. Now, do you think that um, Christian writers can appropriate those stylistic conventions of highly secular genres like postmodernism while remaining true to their faith? Or is there a danger of subconscious influence in reading and imitating that literature? Um, well, first of all, when we're talking about postmodernism, <clears throat> generally what, what I'm talking about is, is a couple authors that I admire that kind of fit into that, that box, that classification. I don't wholeheartedly, um, you know, I'm not, I guess I went through a phase early on my, in my reading life, but I don't anymore just sort of grab anything that's that's, that's postmodern or experimental or, or metafictional or mm -hmm. um, I, I tend to be drawn to uh, to the writers that um, that have sort of um, very specific stylistic um, uh, ways of doing things and, and, and thinking and um, you know when you uh, when you broaden it out, when you broaden the scope out a little bit, I, I, I'm not drawn really to your kind of classic postmodernists like your Robert Coover and your John Barth, who are um, who are doing like the really like the deconstruction of story and the um, you know they're kind of reacting to the literary norms or conventions that came before them or that are surrounding them uh, and, and like specifically attacking that, um, uh, you know, I'd re I, I'm more drawn to just really, really good writing. And some of those writers happen to be in the postmodern vein and some of them aren't, some of them are modernists or, or even older than that, um, or, or uh, you know, have been published recently. So um, <clears throat> to answer your question, I, I'm not sure that I know. I mean, can Christians be tainted by, uh, by secular culture? Yes, of course. Um, if, if, you know, if we're not careful, um, I think it's important to sort of temper the reading that we're doing, that we're intaking with, uh, with scripture and with, uh, conversations with other Christians. And, you know, there's always a risk of, uh, you know, of, of like, um, cultural tainting doesn't really sound like a good way of putting it, but um, there's always a risk of becoming too enamored with, um, uh, with uh, secular culture. Um, and everyone's, I think that everyone's like risk 
uh, threshold is probably different. Yeah, it's uh, it's a it's a pretty schizophrenic balancing act. Um, yeah, making sure that uh, you know you don't violate your convictions while also just kind of acting like a treasure hunter, going through these you know uh, different genres and and pulling you know from the sand which which um, tenets of it you think are are good. Yeah, I suppose one one uh, way to test that would be: Am I willing to drop a book if I if I feel really uncomfortable by it? Um, at a certain point in my life, that that wouldn't have been true. I think it's becoming more true. Um, part of that is just because I've read more now, and uh, you know, I can I can justify it. like I used to feel like I need to finish a book, um, and now I don't feel that way anymore. But, um, but that would be one test. Now. Uh, you have said that you're you're pretty comfortable calling yourself a, an experimental writer. Um, you know, regardless kind of where you fall, I mean, your fiction does like break narrative and stylistic convention regularly. Um, would you say that it's a particular goal of yours uh, to break those conventions, or does it just kind of happen, you know, organically? I guess it depends on the convention um, and it depends, it depends on the work too. I mean, uh, ideally it's happening organically. Um, I don't often, um, well, to back up, I think sometimes I have an idea for a non-conventional way of telling a story, um, you know, uh, whether that's uh, formatting or, or just in the, in the language itself. Um, and if I don't have a good, um, well, the form should match the content. If I don't have a good story that, that sort of fits that form, then it will fall flat, uh, you know, every time. And so the, those two things kind of have to grow up together. I, I don't often just like have, you know, here's a form and then set that aside until I, until I have the right narrative to tell, um, for that form. Usually it happens simultaneously. So in that way, so in that way, it's more often organic than, than not. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, sometimes I make, do I make conscious decisions on like, I'm going to uh, use this kind of, um, this strange punctuation. Um, yeah, I, you know, I, I do that. I do that all the time. And, and again, that kind of, it usually is born out of, um, you know, this story seems to demand um, like a pipeline instead of periods, um, just because I feel like this character's hitting a wall every time he stops thinking, and that that you know that's gimmicky maybe, but it also it just it seems right, and you know it's worth trying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, I, I talked with Bethany Brangan about uh, on on one of the prior podcasts some something similar. She said. Uh, I mean, we, we are kind of working with something objective when we, when we write, um, the, you know, our stories or our poems or whatever, they kind of dictate to you exactly what form they should be in and how they're best going to be expressed. I mean, it's not just, um, as strange as it sounds, even though you're the one who's is writing it. I mean, you, you honestly sometimes don't have a lot of say in, uh, in how it comes out. Um, I mean, you're, you're kind of at bent to its, to its will instead of the other way around. So, yeah, I, I agree with that to a point. Um, I, I can sometimes be suspicious of, of that kind of, uh, of that kind of rhetoric. Um, because I do think that the, <clears throat> that the author, um, I guess the way I would put it is, the, is the author is kind of seeking you know, has control over some of the initial ideas and is trying to put this together, but is seeking uh, a means to lose control of the work. Mm. Um, and, uh, um, and whether that's artificial or, you know, it just sort of happens, um, you know, I, maybe that's just semantics, but um, I think a, a lot of, a lot of pieces that I write and that I read um, that really excite me are the ones that, um, that clearly, you know, it's an act of losing control um, while still like remaining within like, you know, good yeah. sentences and, and that kind of thing. Uh, 
I think that actually, I think the book that that epitomizes this um, for me is is um, Under the Volcano by Malcolm Lowry. Have you read that? No, I haven't. Um, it is it's well, it's about alcoholism uh, ostensibly, but you know, in its style, it sort of epitomizes the the exhilaration of of prose itself slipping out of control. Um, mm-hmm. And uh, and I like I like to search for that. Right. Um, yeah, I, I really love that saying and the, the act of losing control. Um, do, you, do you think that um, that uh, is referring to whenever we get to a point in our writing where it kind of becomes self-sustaining and you don't have to really sit there and think so hard about like exactly what it is that you want to write? Is that is that kind of what you're referring to? Yeah, I think so. And I think it, when we reach that point, we sometimes have a tendency to um, to redact certain things or to like have a hesitancy about this feeling of like, just we're, you know, we have the ball rolling, let's just roll with it. Um, and uh, I have to sometimes consciously, you know, just write it out and let it happen <laughs> um, to use all the cliches in the book um, and then to see what comes out of that. Um, and then I, you know, I can edit it down after the fact if I need to. Mm, okay. Um, so with conventional narrative styles, would you say that they can be a potential crutch for what we would call, I guess, lazy writers? I mean, do you think it's just kind of sometimes too easy to follow the conventional narrative styles and just kind of call it a day as a writer? No, not necessarily. Um, Again, I think that uh, good writing is is a form of good thinking, and so if the thought process that you have is best expressed in a very conventional uh, narrative form, then then you know uh, then the content fits the form, or vice versa, and uh, and it, and it works. It's not you know it's not lazy at all. Um, you know, what, back in like the high modernistic period, you had. Uh, um, you had like the the narrative or the novel paired with the essay, like an, an essayic novel, and that was um, that was like their way of you know this is thinking really really meshed with with narrative form, um, and uh, it, it can really really work. Um, do I sometimes question uh, like a lot of the um, like if you ever see lists of like do's and don'ts of writing fiction, usually those are just disposable. Um, so in, in, you know, so in that way I do question like conventions, if that's what we're talking about when we say conventions, but, um, <clears throat> but I think that, uh, that's only because that's like a prescribed list to, I don't know what the audience of, you know, of those kind of things are. Um, uh, because if you're not like just trying different things out on your own, um, yeah, I, I, I have, I have some doubts about like the MFA kind of, uh, program, um, at the risk of, you know, of making some people mad, but I, that's partly just because it's not like a highfalutin thing at all. I mean, that's partly just because I, I don't think that art can be taught in any real way i think there's a good way to like get a footing um and i think that there are like really really uh, useful um, things about an mfa program where you're in communion with other writers and you're um you're learning that way um but uh as far as like a teacher telling you here's how to write and here's you know how to write um i have some doubts about that yeah um I do too, and I appreciate your, um, I mean, for frankly, bravery in uh, in saying that. I know that you know people can get a lot of flack for for saying stuff like that, so I appreciate that. Um, yeah, it, it seems it all has always seemed to me that with workshops and teaching writing, it's that's it's such an empirical way to go about it. Now, mm-hmm. I mean, I, I don't want to I don't want to ever say that um, there that. You know, it's not objective. There's no objective good writing or anything like that. I mean, in that way, it, it is able to be taught. You know, there are, there are some easily identifiable things, 
to writing where you can say that's good or that's bad generally you mm -hmm. know like concrete imagery and poetry you know um you really have to earn abstraction in poetry um but i mean in another sense there's a there's a way in which all that empirical kind of mindset bends the knee to inspiration and and um genuineness and sincerity mm -hmm. uh, i mean sincerity makes up for a multitude of um of just errors in in like form and all that in fiction and in in poetry and other in other forms um you know that's why that's why a lot of art can work without being the best quote unquote yeah i agree uh, so yeah but no and but no i i really do like i love i love what you said about the mfa so um speaking of that do you see too much homogeneity in the output of most fiction writers today especially those who attend these programs um <clears throat> yeah that's a tricky question i i honestly don't read uh that much um like current day uh writing um part of that is um Part of that is just because I'm genuinely just discovering so much, um, you know, uh, right now I'm going kind of through like a post World War II phase, Eastern European, there's, there's so much there. Um, I just keep discovering these other like older niches of writing that are really challenging, uh, you know, some of the conventions that I hold that I'm not even aware of. Um, and I, you know, I really like that. And so it, from just like a time and energy perspective, uh, I haven't read that much of what's coming out today. Um, I think that the term over is like, that's real. I mean, you see a lot of uh, fairly um, placid vanilla writing, you know, hitting, hitting like the top um, mm -hmm. echelons of, of, of publishing. Part of that is, you know, if we're talking about like what's being published in the big five um, publishers, you know, uh, Penguin, HarperCollins, those, um, the, those decisions are all made on basis of money. Um, you know, I work in a publishing house. I see the way that the editors work. Um, editors are marketers. There's almost no distinction between, between the jobs when we're talking about like the New York big five. Um, and, uh, you know, they get... Um, and just, I mean, to be, to be clear, I, I, I work with these people and I really like them and they're, they're genuine people. It's their job. Um, and you know, they get, um, they, they get like, they're told, you know, they have to make a certain amount at the end of the year. And, uh, you know, that's, that's just their, their budget and you know, it's, it's one job. Um, but I don't think it's really producing that much great writing, um, and uh, yeah, so then you know we look we look at the the smaller presses and a lot of the small journals, and I think there's a lot of really good stuff coming out of that that's just not getting enough um, surface, and that's not being seen by uh, enough people. And um, yeah, I mean, I think that's it's it's exciting when when people do find stuff uh, that's fairly buried. Um, and, and current and, and has been doing done really well. Um, so I should, you know, read more widely of, of like very modern uh, fiction, but I don't, uh, as far as like um, present day um, homogeneity, I, um, I don't know. I think there's a lot of different stuff that's, that's coming out now. And I think that there's so much writing being done that it's hard to classify uh, all of it, or it's hard to say, like, there's just too much of one thing being done. Um, mm -hmm. There's different niches for different people. I, I really like the, the over workshop thing. Um, it's, uh, you know, I, I never attended an MFA, but I did attend um, a BA in creative writing. Mm -hmm. And, you really? know, I, 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 I was too contentious. I was prideful, you know, and, um, I, so <laughs> yeah um you know your youthful zeal will, will will make you kind of a jerk about about your writing sometimes if you if you're inclined that way um mm -hmm. but there's also something too to the to the to the notion that it's like 
I don't want to sound like everybody else. You know, I don't want to say the same things that everybody else is saying. I don't want to say them in the same way. Um, you know, and that's not, that's not always to say that original is necessarily good, but I mean, it's not as boring, <laughs> you know? Yeah. Um, so, so yeah. There's a certain defiance to, you know, to, to all art, I think. Um, yeah, there's just a defiance to it and you're going to rub some people the wrong way. Um, and that's one of the difficulties about being a, a, a Christian artist. It's a, it's a small, it, you know, sort of a side uh, difficulty, but um, how to have the right posture of humility um, and, uh, and, and attempt to do something that you're proud of and attempt to do something that, that's different. Yeah, yeah, you're not going to please everybody. And we're already, I mean, we're so niche. We're niche of a niche of a niche, you know. Yeah. That, I mean, that, you know, there, there's myriad issues and, and whatnot. But, uh, you know, we just, we have to be true to the, to the calling that God gave us and how we, how we think he needs, he wants us to go about it without, well, obviously without losing our, um, our moral convictions and, you know, behaving in a Christ like manner. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> now, um, why don't you tell us a little bit about uh, your about your short piece, uh, a prayer that was featured in the, the first volume of Solemn Journal? Sure. Um, <clears throat> this uh, this was a piece that um, it has a lot of biblical imagery. There's imagery of uh, Jacob's ladder. In fact, the the narrator is is on a basically like an endless staircase going to he doesn't know where, um, and he doesn't, uh, it's not said whether, you know, when he started the journey or, or where it was at the foot of it behind him, he can see, um, what seems to him like a pillar of fire above him, just more stairs to either side, uh, trees, because, you know, that seemed like the right thing to do. Um, and th- there's an aspect of, so there's kind of a Jacob's ladder scene from that part of his story. And there's also like the wrestling with God scene a little bit. Um, at one point he falls asleep and, and falls down a good portion of the stairs. Uh, he's, he's wounded in the socket of his hip um, and some other places. And that's actually a, you know, uh, a line, at least it's, it's how it's translated in my NIV Bible. Um, and so uh, the difference is that this character uh, turns out to be pretty much the opposite of uh, the historical Jacob, who is um, cunning almost to a fault and bold. Um, and the narrator is uh, halting and bashful to the point of an impotence, basically. Um, he's also very self-reflective um, and kind of prone to exaggeration, but he, he uh, attempts to correct himself. Um, there's, a, there's sort of a self-correction to a fault, to a, um, a point of, you know, physical and mental exhaustion, lots of pauses. Um, and he's, uh, to a fault, uh, fo- intensely focused on how exactly to put things, uh, to, you know, to say it. Um, I don't know if it began this way, but it turned into a meditation on prayer, uh, in general. Um, and, uh, I was thinking a lot about prayer as language, um, as well as a kind of progression, um, in a person's life. I mean, there's, um, it, it's true to say that, uh, the prayer, uh, I don't know if this is a C.S. Lewis quote or not, but, uh, prayer changes, does not change God. It changes, you know, the, the prayer. Um, and, uh, there's no, there's no, uh, obvious response to this person's, what seems like a monologue. Um, and there's a lot of him pointing out different things that he sees and feels, um, and backtracking and pausing and falling asleep, um, and groaning. Um, and, uh, um, yeah, I mean, I think, I think all, good writing is a, is a dialogue to a certain degree, um, more than a statement and, and a prayer is a dialogue about a specific kind of dialogue, really. Mm-hmm. So. Mm. Yeah, that's great. Um. Yeah, yeah, I, I really, I really love you know how you how you flesh that out because I, uh, 
I honestly, I don't think I noticed at first about the, the Jacob similarity. Um, but now I, but I do, I do notice now how, um, the character is just kind of frozen by, uh, you know, this indecisiveness of his, um, I really love that. Um, t- to me, it, it read like a fever dream, you know, hmm. um, which was, which was very, uh, very original. Uh, what do you call it a parable or do you just, what do you just say? It's kind of like a parabolic style to it or, or not even that. Um, I hadn't thought of that. I, I don't think I'd call it a parable. <clears throat> um, I think that parables have something in common with, with allegories. Um, and uh, this isn't necessarily like the allegorical prayer. Um, I'm not saying like, this is this necessarily. I'm kind of just, it's kind of a mixed bag of like throwing in some biblical imagery, uh, thinking about some of the, um, the less self-flattering uh, pieces of, of how I feel like I pray um, and taking that to a, to kind of an extreme. Right. Yeah. It's um, uh, like how your mind wanders in prayer. I mean, the, the piece just captures it so well. Um, now about the decision to leave the, the narrator nameless, um, was that a conscious decision or just something that again, kind of happened organically? Um, yeah. My thought about names is, is that um, if, if I'm not willing to, to give many details about the character outside of their thoughts, um, then to name them seems gratuitous. Um, I think it can be a distraction. Um, and I didn't want there to be a, uh, like a feeling that there might be some sort of symbolic nature to the, the person's name if I if I if I name them. Um, so when it doesn't when it doesn't uh, you know harm the understanding of the story, um, or when I don't think it does, I, I like to leave characters nameless. Right. Yeah. Um, I, I know that a lot of a lot of um, writers and teachers of writing they would. You know, they, they often contend like, oh, that, um, you know, characters need names. Things seem to be concrete and detailed in order to be relatable and, and such. But, but yeah, like you said, I mean, it, unless, unless the name carries some symbolic uh, significance or something like that, I often don't find that um, I really need them, you know? Uh, yeah. I mean, especially if we're talking about allegory or, par- or parables, that can even take you out of it um, because it, it kind of ruins the universality. Uh, but um, but I think yeah, the temptation for the reader to try to find a, like a symbolic, you know, nature to a name, uh, or there is a temptation for the reader to find that. Um, I actually really like the way that Cormac McCarthy does his his characters. He almost always names them but then he almost never uses their name. Um, you know, you'll, you'll read the, the person's name that shows up like three times in a book. Um, and part of that is, you know, it's easy for him to do because he only has like three characters in a book. And so pronouns work. Um, but, uh, but I, I kind of like that. He names them, but then the name isn't important, you know? Exactly. Yeah, exactly. Um, so, what do you, what what was your hope with the story like that ultimately it would say on your end? Um, <clears throat> it's more of a meditation uh, sort of um, <laughs> with a decent amount of panic. Um, I think I don't know that I'm trying to say anything uh, in particular more than just. Um, uh, more than just this is, you know, this is some thoughts about, uh, about prayer and um, the sort of indefiniteness of speaking to a creator who, uh, who we, you know, we, we believe in and we do our best to continue to continue to have uh, um yeah, to continue to have faith in and, and to obey. Um, 
but we don't often get like a, uh, a definitive response. Um, and at the end of, at the end of the story, he does like Jacob ask for a blessing, but he does it in like a very, um, you know, like, gosh, I, I feel like I should ask for a blessing, you know, um, this seems like the right thing to do right now. Uh, yeah. and, and he, he has a, or he has a realization that he can, he can go on. Um, I, I think part of the, part of the story came out as a response against, um, so Samuel Beckett is, is someone that, that I admire as a writer, but he's, he's nihilistic. Um, and I have, you know, some problems with his worldview, obviously. And his mantra is, um, uh, is I, I think it shows up in a couple different of his works, but he says, I can't go on. I'll go on. Um, and it's, it's, it's hopeless. It, you know, he makes it hopeless, but I, I see a, I see a hope in there uh, as a Christian. Um, I think there's, that's a beautiful statement. Um, and I might, I might be misunderstanding something about Beckett's worldview and, and uh, you know, how he thought about, uh, religion. I don't think I am from what I've read, but, um, but I could be. Um, and this work was in part born out of a response to, I can't go on, I'll go on. Um, there's a certain level of prayerfulness that can be found in that from, you know, from the right voice. Um, it doesn't have to be a nihilistic statement. Um, and uh, so that's, you know, that's what was in my head. Um, as I, as I wrote that. Um, so the story is primarily dialogue and image driven. Um, now, do, do you think that that is often better, uh, for fiction instead of just a conventional narrative, like what we would call, you know, a strong story or, uh, plot points or anything like that? I mean, do, do you think it can carry it along just as well? I think it can carry along just as well. Yeah. I don't think that it's necessarily stronger than, uh, you know, than, than uh, typical you know, plot and narrative um, structure. Um, <clears throat> uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I think that they, again, the, the form should match the content and I think that they are on equal footing in different, uh, in different times. Okay, so uh, tell us now about uh, your second story that will be coming out in volume two, Titanomachy. Sure, yeah. Um, well, uh, first of all, the, the name, um, Titanomachy means, uh, well, it's, it's, it's a war that was fought between the Olympians, uh, the younger gods of the Greeks and the Titans. Um, and uh, if you look it up on Wikipedia, there's an image of, of a lot of very nude men. Um, who are the Titans falling out of, uh, out of Olympus um, or wherever they were. And uh, <clears throat> um, so the, the, the first, well, I should back up. The, the story is a, is a science fiction. Um, it, it takes place on a, a planetary research outpost uh, somewhere in space. Um, and on it, an, an old man is basically reading unattributed reflections uh, about the books of Ecclesiastes and Revelation primarily. Um, mm -hmm. And he's thinking about meaning and um, eschatology or, uh, you know, the theology of end times. Um, his, he has one companion, uh, a young woman who's a scientist, um, and she's stationed there specifically to chart the disappearances of stars um, as they're, they're happening across the visible universe. Um, and so it's a it's it's really a story that's dealing with uh, eschatology and meaning. Um, the premise is drawn from a, a line in Revelation that talks about a third part of the stars disappearing um, from heaven, and a third part of the sun. Um, <clears throat> and uh, um, I'm I, I'm conscious of being both very pseudo -the theological and very pseudo scientific in the story, I'm, I'm basically just wondering a number of things, uh, in a, in a format fiction that allows me to, that allows me to wonder them without being blasphemous or, or wrong. Um, and, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think, I think what came out was, uh, a story about, 
um, about loneliness um, and wondering uh, wondering about the end. And I think that uh, the story of the end is important um, is an important uh, story for for Christians and for for anyone really, but especially for Christians because we're sort of given this this narrative in scripture that that says you know this will happen um and there's a lot of mystery around it but um and this is supposed to be uh, both terrifying and hopeful um as terrifying and hopeful as i find the book of, of ecclesiastes which uh the coolest thing about <laughs> one of one of the coolest things about christianity is that is that it has its scripture has the book of ecclesiastes which basically <clears throat> uh, absorbs nihilism, you know, the, the, uh, it probably King Solomon, but you know, the teacher says everything is meaningless and starts there. Um, there's nothing new under the sun. It's a posture of extreme despair. Mm -hmm. Um, and, uh, and you know, this book is absorbed by the book that contains the gospels, um, which is, is remarkable. Um, in a lot of ways. Um, and so kind of meshing a bunch, number of different thoughts together um, in maybe a jumbled way. Uh, but uh, there's, you know, the impetus and the, and the kind of setup for the story. Yeah, uh, that, that was great. Um, yeah, what, what I really loved about the story when I read it um, was not, it, it didn't like try to flesh out exactly why the stars were dying or it didn't try to build up some mythos or, or really backstory or anything like that. It's, it's more, um, these characters are just dealing with the tragedy of all that was going on around them in this fictional world. Um, and the loneliness of being isolated on that planet and stu studying the death of, of these celestial entities, uh, you know, that, that had died probably, you know, uh, thousands of years before. Now, again, back to the names, the naming scheme. Um, the woman name is named Sadek. Is that, is that right? I said. Yeah. Um, yeah. But the main character is. I mean, as far as I know, he's unnamed. W was there another reason behind this, or or not? Yeah. This <clears throat> um, this came out m more as a. Um, Usually, I mean, usually I don't name a character immediately as I'm writing, and I kind of if it needs if he needs a name, I'll think of one, uh, I'll think of one later. But increasingly, the, the character, the main character, felt faceless to me, um, sort of, uh, um, sort of beyond a name in a certain way. Uh, whereas the the character of Sadek, and and he, it, you know, she's seen entirely through his eyes. Um, she's you know spirited and alive and um and cheerful uh despite all um and i think that's what is most surprising to him about her um it's it's not it's not a love story uh, necessarily i mean not a romantic love story um he's significantly older but it is a love story in the sense that he he does um you know deeply uh care for her in his loneliness um and he's He's consistently impressed by her, um, and uh, the conversations that they have. I mean, uh, I think there's there's some humor there, um, and, and um, yeah, and she's just uh, just remarkable because she's cheerful. Right, she's still got some youthful. Well, I was about to say some like. Um, almost like naive hope or something, but then I was like, "Well, no, not not exactly." She seems she seems pretty level headed, um, and the she doesn't seem naive to me. Um, but I don't know that. I'm, I I also see her through the eyes of the main of the you know the narrator, and I don't know that he can quite figure her out uh, either. Yeah, I mean, there there are moments in the story where she's almost more um, uh, defeated in her mentality than he is. Mm -hmm. uh, or uh, maybe she's more cognizant of it. I guess I, I don't. Know, I'm not sure. But um, yeah, I mean, what, what I liked is that you is that you didn't just like make her young and dumb, you know. Um, and yeah. uh, you know that the narrator is old and crotchety, and 
Um, I mean, you, you really flipped the script on that. So that was, that was very enjoyable to read. Thank you. Um, so uh, coming on volume two, read it. Um, so cool. uh, now just, uh, in, you know, in closing, we'll just move to some more like general writing questions. Um, so just what do you think is the purpose of writing fiction as a Christian? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, <clears throat> yeah, at, as a Christian, um, well, for one, I, I should say that um, partaking in art or in something that you take so seriously, um, but it doesn't necessarily, it kind of, it, it's defiant towards our kind of um, present day obsession with like efficiency and with what has use um, art, art is in general. And that's why, I mean, that's part of why art is, I think, in kind of a bad way um, because of our, of our culture. And so to take on uh, doing this thing that you love um, and to, to do it in a posture of, um, of, of extreme care and also a little bit of defiance uh, makes it very, very powerful. And so something I struggle with as a Christian is how to keep writing from being um, an idol. Um, uh, because I think that it sometimes trends that way um, for me, because uh, I spend you know lots of time thinking about it and uh, take it very seriously. Um, and if there's one thing from reading the, the Bible, if there's one thing that I feel like God takes seriously, it's idols. Um, and so it's something that I try to take seriously as well. Um, but I think that uh, I think that that's part of what makes it important. That, you know, is uh, if I am if I am taking it seriously from a standpoint of wanting to um, uh, partake in um, a conversation with with other Christians and with um, with Christ in a way, um, because uh, because thoughts to a certain degree are prayers. Um, and, uh, and so I, th I, so there's a, there's a tension always, uh, in, in my thinking about, um, why I write, but, um, I came across recently just for, um, writing as a tool in and of itself, um, within and without, uh, faith spheres. Um, uh, I came across a, uh, a quotation from, um, Robert Masuel, uh, who's a, um, he wrote the man without qualities um, from a, he's a German writer. Um, he said, and this is specifically about the novel, but I think it can be extended to fiction in general. He said, uh, the novel is the greatest tool we have for fusing together the two great halves of life, metaphor and truth. And I think that's, that's what Jesus was doing with his parables really um, as if we're looking at parables as, as like an example to us um, in, in what we're doing, um, it kind of occurred to me that, uh, you know, Jesus being fully God and fully man, his parables were fully truth and fully metaphor, making them kind of a perfect narrative form um, just from a, you know, completely, um, uh, you know, form and, and, uh, um, yeah, just from a form standpoint, I mean, uh, the kingdom of heaven is like this. The kingdom of heaven is like that. He kept, he, he you know, he keeps, he keeps saying, um, and it's not something that everyone is, is understanding when he's talking about it. Um, and, uh, you know, despite that it's, 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 it's this perfect narrative form that, that we aspire to. Um, and so I like that quote and I like thinking about it in, in terms of Christianity um, I actually like, I like flipping secular artists, uh, work and thinking about them through the lens of Christianity, because I think that that sheds different lights on them. Um, so, uh, yeah, it's a little rambling, but I, I, that's an answer, to, one answer to your question. Yeah. Yeah. Um, no, I see a certain, uh, for the last like 25 or 30 years, there's been a certain hesitancy with Christian writers and musicians as well to call their their work you know uh, Christian literature or uh, mm -hmm. you know Christian uh, rock or Christian music or whatever um, 
do you think that they should call their work, you know, Christian literature or whatever, or not? Um, and, and why or why not? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think it was in, in high school during the whole, like, uh, um, John Foreman doesn't want, you know, Switchfoot to be called a, a Christian band because, you know, they want to reach a broader audience, which I understand. Uh, I, I can, I can see both, both sides. Um, I don't know. I mean, I think it depends on who you want your audience to be. I don't think for a variety of reasons, I don't think that art, uh, or that writing is, um, is evangelistic in the sense of we, of how we normally think of evangelizing or evangelism. Um, because it doesn't, it doesn't, it doesn't seek to, um, uh, to, to think for a person, you know, it's, it's, um, you know, giving us a, a certain impetus for thought. Um, and so I, you know, I don't have a problem either way. Um, uh, either way, I think being a Christian writer is an especially uh, lonely, <laughs> potentially uh, lonely proposition because we're kind of isolated from uh, a larger artist community um, just from a purely lifestyle standpoint. And, uh, and, you know, we know as, as writers, it's, it's already a little bit lonely because we're separated from, you know, from other people who don't, aren't interested or don't think, don't think the same way, um, and, you know, think in other important ways. Uh, so, um, yeah. 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 You know, um, it, it's odd that you, it's odd that you say that I, uh, like as I was starting Solom and all that with my friend Bart, um, I, I mean, maybe my mindset was more like, I just, uh, I want to promote good Christian art or whatever, but mm -hmm. as it's gone on, I, I've kind of realized my calling is less that and more like to really create a good Christian literary community, you know, uh, like and one which intersects with academia, Christian academia. Um, yeah. So yeah, I, I think that, there's something more fundamental about that. Um, so ho hopefully that, that will be what, uh, what that amounts to. Um, so what do you hope that your, you know, your style and your perspective uh, with your fiction will do for, for Christ in literature? Well, I, I hope that, um, that it will be a vehicle of thought, uh, for some, I mean, it, it, it certainly is for myself, but I'm, I'm just speaking for myself in that. And, and by, um, by sending it out into the world, what I'm saying is that I'm hoping that someone else, um, will, uh, uh, will be interested in thinking uh, along similar lines, um, not necessarily to agree with, with me, but just, to, again, just to enter into a, a, a dialogue, um, and um, I think that it's important to have a sense of, um, of, a, of lack of control when it comes to working uh, for Christ as well, because, um, because you don't know what he's doing on many different levels. And, and there's, there's many, um, I mean, I, th I think there's infinite circumstances in which the person who does something that has an effect, it has no idea what, you know, what that effect amounts to, um, uh, or what Christ works in something. Um, so I'm, you know, I'm putting work out there where I can and, uh, just hoping, hoping something comes out of that one, you know, one of those things being this conversation, which is, which has been really fun. So what advice would you give to other Christian writers who are writing similar material to you? Yeah, right. Writers is writers' advice is always a is always a tough thing, um, because you know because everyone everyone is different and and uh, uh, you know what what advice works for some people just completely doesn't work for for another person. I have um, uh, one 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 quote that I think I think helps with that. Um, Tolstoy he wrote a kind of justification to War and Peace. Um, at the end of the book and in it, he gave a, a definition of the novel, which again, I think can apply to all fiction um, as, and I quote, 
what the author wanted and was able to express in the form in which it is expressed, uh, which is very open-ended. Um, but for me, it's kind of a, the buck stops here piece of writing advice. Um, th there's a humility to it because he says was able to express. Um, but there's also a really important defiance to it um, that I think an artist needs to have, Christian or not. Um, and as a Christian, I think I'd add that it's important for uh, the author to pay close attention to what to what they want and what they're able to express. Um, because I think that we learn about our faith uh, personally and collectively um, from that. Um, and if that expression, I think that if that expression of Tolstoy's is passed through close biblical examination, um, uh, not for some theological reason, but for the sake of close biblical examination, uh, then the Christian writer or artist, uh, I believe, has a very high potential for serious and important work. Well, Andrew, this has uh, been great. Uh, I love talking to you. I love, I love, I've loved reading your work. Um, it's, you. uh, it's at once just uh, intellectually dense, and it's also just fraught with emotion too, uh, which is so rare. Um, you know, you are a writer to be admired, imitated, and uh, followed. So, very, very grateful to have you as part of Solem. Um, and uh, I'm looking really looking forward to just what you put out soon. Thank uh, you, Ryan. All righty. Well, uh, thank you for listening. Bye bye.